Welcome to the writer's block. I'm Todd, and that's HD Andy over here. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to talk about writing again <laughs> for the 23rd time. This is episode 23 of our first series of episodes. So, yeah. So, uh, we just have a couple of like random uh, questions we're going to kind of talk about today and answer and provide I'll our. Start. I'll start off first. All right. HD Andy has the first question of the evening. Okay. What's it like being in recording in space? I'm just curious. Well, uh, two things not much oxygen and a lot of radiation. I don't think I'll survive long. I think I'd rather be at a beach, if I'm being honest with you. You know, I can. I can kind of imagine now the 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 wind of the beach and the the palm fronds, you know, gusting back and forth, and the waves crashing on the shore. Hey, look at that! <laughs> that beach. How did I get there? I just fell right out of the sky. Uh, well, at least I won't die now. How, that's how's true. It, how's it like being in a much more high definition version of your room? I I I'm still aghast on how clear this picture is you can actually see my cat now like yeah. for real for real so we're gonna ignore him as much as possible today <laughs> yeah, well Sully is the real star of the show we're uh -huh. really background character you know it's like family matters you know Steve Urkel wasn't the main character but he kind of was he kind of was if you've ever seen that I have. He is. He was never considered a main character in that. I he wasn't thought. even in the first seasons, if I remember correctly. Oh, it was just about huh. the. It was the, the guy that played the cop, and it was just it was his family. And then Steve Urkel was like a supporting character, but he was very well received. Kind of. I actually have a, a Steve Urkel uh, figure. Maybe on the next episode, I'll I'll prop him up behind me or something. You know, did I do that? Yet? When you when you come back from the beach. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm probably going to come back pretty soon. I want to head up north, you know. I've always wanted to see those uh, those lights in the sky. What, what do they call them? The, the northern lights? Northern lights. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Dang, that, that's pretty cool. I was going to say it would stink for all these people listening on Spotify right now not to see what's going on. But yeah. after you told me today's uh, uh, stats <laughs> on the listeners of Spotify. I don't think I'm too concerned. Well, I wasn't going to brag about this, but uh, or about that, but yeah, there's nobody watching on Spotify or listening for that matter. But um, yeah, um, hopefully this is actually showing up too on the final video because it's always possible that all of these backgrounds are like copyrighted and they won't actually be saved. And I don't know, that would really suck. That would be but, interesting because then my initial question would be to have no make no sense. There would be no context yeah. at all. Yeah, that would be pretty unfortunate. It's mm. probably best that that doesn't happen, you know. So, <laughs> I guess let's, uh, let's get back to Earth and, uh, you know, talk about uh, writing, shall we? We shall. Yeah. Okay, well, would you like to ask the, make the first well, question? Or? Well, no, I already asked my first question. I think it's your turn now. All right, well, so here's a a topic that I thought was really interesting, or a question that I thought was really interesting. So obviously, uh, as far as I know, we're both men. So uh, how is it, how do you feel, or how do you, I guess, write for the opposite gender? You know, when you're writing for the character of a non-male, how uh, do you go through any particular process of creating the dialogue or creating the character themselves or building the background is there anything that you base them off of or do you have a process at all or you're just kind of like wing it and kind of not really think about it too much uh i think for me i think i i wing it because i don't have a lot of well i mean i haven't really constructed my novel enough to where i use a lot of dialogue with with the female characters that are in it but i don't I, they're mostly trying to think first person and or from the uh or from third person view so i don't i don't really think i've ever really dove or thought about it to be honest with you so that that question stumping me now as i'm trying to go back and think about all the okay no there's one 
so Rue, we bring this up, we bring that uh, story up almost every episode, but that's in the per it's the point of view of a female, but there's not a lot of context, like not of uh, not a lot of <clears throat> sorry uh, talking in that. I think it's more of just storytelling. So I don't I don't really think about it as much as I probably should. I don't know if I probably I don't know if I would what I would do. What about what, yeah, what about some of the be? interactions you've worked on with your book th- thus far? Um, there's female officers or yeah, deputies, right? Yeah, there's, there's one. Some interactions. There's interaction, and she's. De- I think so far what I have, which is not a lot, and it's March fourth, and it was supposed to be done by now, but that, I digress. Um, there's. Uh, banter going back and forth where she's like the adult figure in the like I think I've described this before with herself and the other deputy that she's kind of like taking under her wing so to speak but there's not I haven't really written those scenes out I have them outlined but I don't I haven't thought about it that in that way yet um and then as of late there has been um a lot of second person and then oh well in my time series there was first person from the female point of view but there wasn't a process there yeah it was like at a- all it was just kind of a storytelling idea and then in the story that by the time this airs has been dropped already this new short story there's a little blip of like a first person view from a female perspective, but it's like three sentences and it's the end of the story. So after all that, I can't, I don't think that was a lot of context in my blambing for the last five minutes, but <laughs> that's, that's all I got. That's a, that's a good question. That's a very good question that I haven't really thought about. I mean, have you, do you take a lot of dialogue and stuff or <clears throat> into consideration or like prepping? Um, Oh, let me think about it. So a lot of the dialogue that I use, I think I touched on this in a previous episode where I talked about how I, I listened to a lot of conversations going on around me and I kind of like tucked them away into like a, a memory bank of dialogue options for characters to use in books. And so a lot of the female characters that I have, I they're they're based off of people I know or they're not like 100 percent, but they're kind of like their characters themselves are somewhat based off of people i know or they're uh based off of other characters or something like that and, you know they're there's some kind of i guess i don't know some kind of root in the real world and then uh, some of the like the dialogue usually kind of stems from that i guess um i don't really do a whole lot of research well, now that you say that, um, I've definitely used quotes from my mother in short stories that have made yeah. it. That's <laughs> yeah. for sure. So that's, I think that's the most outside research that I've used. And that's just from memory. Yeah. So. I, got, I have used a couple, there are a couple characters that are somewhat based off of my mom. There's um, some characters that are like, like loosely based off of my sister in a very, very indirect way. You know, like you would never know it if you were reading the story, but I might have started off with like her, you know, my sister, and then kind of built on that with different characteristics, different life experiences. And then that kind of shapes some of their dialogue and some of their future relationships or future growth or development. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's like for me, it's not any more difficult writing a like female perspective as opposed to a male perspective like it's just like in some instances there's like slight differences or there's other things to take into consideration while you're writing but overall it's uh not yeah there, i was gonna say i don't i wouldn't foresee it being that difficult i feel like it's other than like the slight differences like you said I think there are things that like I might not be taking into consideration that might be worth taking into consideration that I yeah. you know just don't know about. But yeah. 
it's because you you have authors that uh, take like they do first person or third person from the, the different gender and then like the opposite gender of that their own and then right through it like it's like it's nothing so i'd say yeah. it would be interesting to ask how they if they have a process where they just pretend like it's themselves you know that could be in you know they're writing like they're themselves but in a different yeah. like, version of them i do think that like a big portion of it is just experiencing the world around you because you can mm -hmm. i think it's, it's easier to craft a character if you have a large like, base of interactions to choose from you know like you've got all these people you've interacted with or people that you've listened talked to or whatever and you can you know use that information that knowledge and experience to craft characters from those inspirations i feel like yeah i don't know i bet i don't know how it works for everyone so that's a, that's a question worth asking the entire world all of Earth, is. one might say. And they could leave a comment below or be a guest on our podcast. It's one of the two. There is always room for guests. We there have is. this entire planet, after all, to, to do this upon. But uh, yeah, so uh, well, that's that was my question. What is your question, Mr. HD will... Andy? <laughs> Is that what you're going to call me from now on? Uh, just for the next three or four weeks. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, <laughs> I guess one of, one of the questions that I found is what's the process that we take to, into brainstorming story ideas? That's a good question. That's, that's off to you first there, Skipper. <laughs> so what's the brainstorm process of making a story? Yeah, for for us, yeah. Like to come up. Do with we have? Do, do you, yeah, like a storyline or a character development or any sort of. Well, I mean, anything. like so, story ideas. As odd as this might sound, they just pop into my head at random moments, mm -hmm. and then over time, I develop them and then craft a story out of that. Sometimes it could take days to develop it into a full length story. Sometimes it could take years. I mean, I've got this fantasy series i've been working on for I don't know, eight years now i feel like which probably will get made someday but you know i don't know um so i don't know if that answers your question or not but it's uh well i have a similar answer like i just kind of come up with stuff like if through like this new story that by this point has dropped i pretty sure i we were either off camera talking about it like prepping for the show or it was during the episode and i was like huh it just popped in my head i wrote it down and then i spat out 10 pages Damn. well yeah uh, so yeah i guess I, like, same yeah the same for me applies to short stories too i would say i get i'll just suddenly have an idea and i'll, I'll write it down on a, on a slip of paper you know and then try to write it whenever i can and you know build upon that and then sometimes I'll, I'll see if i can knock out you know additional sequels to it you know even if they're only mm. four or five pages like i have two short story collections i've put out recently one deals with this sort of apocalyptic event and the world has to kind of decide on what to do next to try to mitigate disaster and you know lo and behold they, they choose the wrong choice and so it's like five stories five you know short stories about it starts off with looking forward beyond 2049 and then the the last one was the uh the, the dusk of human empire so you know certainly a, a pause ends on a positive note as it can as it can hear uh it's actually it was a neat series that all started off with a uh school project i had to write a utopian short story and I will end up having to write a dystopian short story uh, at sometime later this month, I think, maybe early April. Uh, do you plan on releasing those stories to the public? Yeah, yeah always. Definitely, I think yeah. they're worth it. I mean, it's very different, you know, because these are creative short stories, but they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're being essays, essentially. Yeah, so it's yeah. really weird. 
the creative aspect is I've never seen that in a, you know, university level course before. So it's kind of cool. In a university level course, it's not creative writing or English. Right. Or what have you. I was going to say, I took a lot of those classes, <laughs> Yeah, but they're I mean, all this English is a, based. This is a class on dystopian political thought. So it's, you know, you would expect to be comparing and contrasting the, the worlds of Aldous Huxley and uh, Orwell, whatever his name was. George. Oh, his George. name wasn't even George Orwell. It was actually something else. George. It was a uh, pen name. I forget his first. His original name was something. Poor guy died of tuberculosis. Just like two years after 1984 came out. Didn't get to really enjoy those uh, those, those prime styles. years. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, such is the way. I had an interesting life worth looking into if you uh, enjoy his his works. But uh, so yeah, there's another short story collection that I did that was I started off with a, a story called The Patriot and the Other, and it was kind of kicked off by this uh, uh, political. It was political. This guy named Rick Scott, great senator from the state of Florida. Uh, yeah, uh, he he released this uh, plan of action, I guess, and it was very like reading through it. It just kind of gave me a lot of dystopic dystopic vibes, you know. Um, you know what kind of education should be taught? You know, a, a, a mandatory pledge of allegiance. All these kind of like culture war issues that are that people don't really people care about but it doesn't really affect them you know i don't want to get too deep in politics i know hd andy's not a big fan but oh, i don't <laughs> but this, this whole story got me to write this you know basically it was, a, it was a four or five page speech by somebody basically doing the same thing you know saying it was you know, mandatory uh pledge of allegiance for the this great nation every single day and uh history is going to be taught as it should be in a way that you know exemplifies the uh the, the great accomplishments of the country. I don't ever like name drop anyone or even name drop the country. I just kind of left it as it is. So it's kind of applicable to wherever you want to place it. But that kind of was going to start a sort of back and forth series. But then, uh, you know, the beginnings of World War Three broke out and kind of ended that series. Because then that gave me an idea for a different story. But yeah, story ideas that just kind of pop in my head. So yeah so you could say like you're not you don't look far forward like if you think of if you have this like for me my time series it once i realized it was going to be hold on yeah i would say most of my short stories that i've released were ideas that popped in my head the previous day you know like it was okay. it was like it was an idea wrote it down and then the very next day once i had a, a chance to write it out Write it out. Yeah, sorry, uh, Grandma dropped off food. Anyway, <laughs> I'll look at uh, my time series. Anyway, after I realized it was going to be more than just the three that I had, I guess, thought about. Um, it just went time. Like after, I think when you and I talked about it and gave me ideas for the next two after. The third short story, I can't remember the title. And then after that, I would I didn't write anything for a while. And then I came back and I was like, oh, this would work. And then I did two more and then that was it. Like, I don't have a well planned out, like, oh, yeah. written on my calendar. Like, oh, this is, or in a book or a whiteboard. Like, oh, this is how this entire series is going to work. And here's yeah. the end game, blah, blah, blah. It would be interesting to try and do that, but... Yeah, it would be too. tough too because now you're so focused on the overall end goal. I can I think that's one of my issues with my novel. Even it's like I I have this very specific ending that I want to create and make like as perfect as humanly possible. Now I have to work up to getting to that point, and that's realizing that it's kind of tough to do. Yeah, I mean. Short stories are a little bit different than full-length novels for me, but most of my short stories 
I when I make one, I don't always intend on making another one. But the door is okay. always open for all. Like there was the series that I put out in December where it was like it was a really depressing series. I kind of I stopped making them. Then I suddenly made another one like two or three days ago. I think it actually just dropped on my website. Although it was a more positive, you know, addition to that series. But you know, and so it was also kind of a a, a more final note to the series of short stories that I, and that are all interconnected there. So like, I theoretically could add more to it, but it's only if I feel like it's necessary. What? Was it the best friend one? I'm trying to think if I read it or not. It was short. Yeah. Well, there are four of them that came out. One, uh, so the first one was called season unending. Yeah. You know, I had depression. Okay. Yeah. No, I remember that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe like, I did read. Like yeah. No, I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, kinda yep, got some, yep. some dark got it. thoughts. Yep. yep. And uh, got it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get I don't want you to give it away. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's, I I honestly don't know if anyone actually reads them, so it's like uh, I, I I write them because I enjoy writing them. Yeah. Nobody reads reads them, like that's not gonna stop me from making more. But if people do read them, then cool. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, if uh I, I have a new um uh, integrated blog whatever on my website since uh the website domain well the, the website builder i use it's a company called godaddy great name for a company their internal blog stopped working and i don't know why and i was using that blog to put out short stories or updates or excerpts from the books i'm working on so i, I now have a wix account which is integrated. Uh, it, it, yes. Nothing like if you if you have been looking at my website for short for short stories, nothing really changed. It's just that instead of like when you click on the article or when you, when you click on the, the post now, it'll take you directly to the Wix page as opposed to you know expanding it within the website itself. So nothing too. That's now. a good. That's a good thing to know because when you first sent me your Wix website, I typed in the domain name like. 16 times and it said this doesn't exist this doesn't exist and i, I don't i don't understand so i went to your whole website and then did what you just explained I was like, oh that's some high tech stuff i mean it should still exist on its own i think mm -hmm. technically i mean it i might have said uh, I, I could send you a link later see if i can figure it out um like it, it's I know still, the, well, the link you sent me initially that i could go i think I, it worked but when i if you wanted to type in oh you know, yeah, yeah. type it in in Google. That doesn't work. Even Actually, if you type I, in, I only use the website for the the blog functions. There's no other links to it. I don't really want to promote that particular website. I, you know, because I want my you know, tidebuyer.com to be the the, the core, the, the yeah. staple of my my brand, so to speak. Um, so yeah, but it's yeah, it works out pretty well so far. So. And I can actually see uh, if people read articles now, as opposed to mm -hmm. just simply website visits, which people have been going to the website. I think I average like roughly 30 views a month, but I'm sure some of those are me because I, I click on it every once in a while just to see what it looks like. Not from my web, web builder page, you know, but yeah. I think you can also leave comments on Wix. So yes, you can. The, the comments system on the GoDaddy blog thing was shut down in November. So, uh, yeah, finally, people can tell me if my crap sucks or if it's they don't, you know, yeah. moderately okay, They're... but just not quite their cup of tea. So <laughs> whatever kind of comment you want to leave, it's uh, there if you want to do it. And I don't, uh, I'll probably respond. I don't even, I don't even get those. <laughs> I don't even get comments, bad comments. I just am like, okay, that's it. Yeah. yeah. But I still ask every single time I put like the new notification, like, hey, there's a new story. Please critique. I don't even say leave a nice comment. I just like, please critique it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. Writing short stories, I haven't really, I mean, this, the short stories I write are very short. I mean, five or six pages. I usually don't go beyond 10. So it's, short like emphasis on the short you know so i i, I read them because i enjoy them I yeah. them, even if it's a page long i wrote a short page long story about this couple that was uh 
they were inside a building and there's a horrible tornado coming through and it, it was something that I just thought of while watching a video of uh, it was a, some kind of it was this like constant loop of a wailing siren that you would hear if there was a tornado coming and um, it was it was very like like it wasn't inherently a dark video it was just this, these clouds this tornado and then the siren going on for like an hour nothing really else happening and it just kind of got me thinking of this couple trying to serve trying to survive this tornado you know the lights going out things flying around the window is shattering and the constant wailing of the siren and the rain and the hail and um just put it together in a really really short short story and it was pretty good and i enjoyed it i even actually i took the the title of it from a, a comment to that video somebody was like they were like this should be called the, the blissful depart because part of the what had some people had thought was that uh you know people were dying <laughs> in this situation so yeah i don't know they just come to me short stories and yeah. then i throw them on the internet uh, that's pretty much how i am too it's just you see something like oh this would work or you experience something oh this will work but i never divulge which i've witnessed and which i've experienced because that's a compromise of privacy yeah <laughs> yeah i mean I think nowadays most of the stuff that I write is uh, it's all fictional, not really based on anything, any like real life, and not any like personal events. It's yeah. just stuff that kind of pops into my head. My imagination, a little hyperactive sometimes. Never a bad thing. That's why we write to get it all on paper. True. For the Very world true. to see, sort of, kind of. For anyone who wants to see it, well, for anyone even who even knows about it, I mean, I, wow. I don't really ever uh, market any of my stuff. So, but I, I kind of, I do plan on like changing that up a bit when I finally get my climate dystopia book completed. Like that's going to be the first book that I ever actually try to shop around to a genuine publisher. That one, that one's going to be my, my, uh, you know, my staple, my. Uh, I don't know, whatever the right word is that describes the best thing I've bread, ever made. <laughs> bread and butter. It's going to be your bread and butter. It's going to be the, the one that gets you over the edge and having you kick me off as a co-host to have someone more famous. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, I mean, if I'm lucky, it'll it'll be good. But So I'm taking a, a year off of school. I'm going to focus on that book the entire time. Doing all the research, doing all the world building, doing all the, the outlining, the world crafting, and it's, it's a whole lot to do. I also have to narrow down exactly what the themes are and the main concepts behind the book and the message. But I still have another book to write before I do that one. So kind of busy. And I'm working on this culture war series on my main channel. So that's another thing. And I'm still in school, so yeah, a little, a little busy these days. Yeah, I was gonna say you're kind of busy now. I mighty Mister Busy here. Yeah, <laughs> sucks to suck. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll ask another question, just to since we're kind of talking about it. What does literary success look like to you? of uh, being able to live off of my writing I guess I mean not honestly I think success would be having any kind of following at all having any genuine fans that genuinely get excited when they see me tweet out about a new story or a new book or like wow I like the way this person writes and I want to read more from them that would be that would be success I'd probably have to agree like on that one. If I had, if I could have one book that like hits and it's like, Oh, can you sign this for me? Or just have like one little yeah. small, like pop up 
book signing in a bookstore or a coffee shop or something. Nothing like, well, I, it's a hundred dollars, you know, for, for, you know, a hundred dollars an autograph is something. Yeah. And then, like you said too, if I put out there a new story and, and it was at the beginning of my website, it was kind of like that. It was like still the, the honeymoon phase, I guess you could call it, where people were looking at like all these short stories. And then, yeah, well, that's why I did. specify genuine fans. Genuine yeah. fans will come back as opposed mm-hmm. to people that are like, hey, I'm helping out a friend. Yeah. You know, I'm just trying to support them. I don't really care about the stuff, but I just want to yeah. leave a like, watch 10 seconds or read 10 seconds of it. Just, you know, you know give it a little heart. You know, that's to me, it's like great and all, but yeah. it doesn't help us. It I mean, doesn't it, help it's, me. It's, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. I want because you know, it, yeah. <laughs> if you if you do like the heart and like or read you, so you th- for me, I don't see who reads it. It's just unless you create, you become a member or whatever, a Wix member or an account. I don't see who reads it. I just see where they're from. So if this person what happens to like it, I don't know if they've read the whole thing, 10 seconds, none of it. They're just liking it just to like it. Yeah. So that's why comments are more and more important as time goes on, because then I understand who's writing it or who, what, where it's coming from and why you're actually reading it. And if you point out specific details from what I have written, then it proves that you've read the whole thing. Mm-hmm which then helps me create a new story to, and then like kind of use or keep in the back of my head of what people, what you have said. Yeah. That would help literally. That would be success right there. Yeah. Like I, if some, a certain kind of feedback could be cool. Like, Hey, you know, uh, your your dialogue doesn't seem natural. It doesn't seem like it flows like a genuine conversation would have, or Hey, this isn't entirely correct. That that would be kind of neat. It's mostly just, you know, like it, it'd be cool to have a genuine following of, of people that are like, yeah, you, you bring a particular voice that I haven't seen before, or you have a particular perspective. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, like, I don't even have any authors that I can think of that I have that kind of, um, I guess, support for, you know, like I've read a lot of books, but there's not like one author that I always go back to. I mean, so yeah. Like, I mean, I had someone kind of like describe my writing style, or, <clears throat> excuse me, style, kind of like James Patterson's. Like it, it's detailed, but it's not over drawn out, like scenes and whatever. So I thought that was pretty cool. That was that was in the beginning, so I thought that was pretty cool. Like that was a genuine critique. Sometimes if I send my short stories out to people there's one or two people and they read it they're like you missed a period you missed a comma like short stuff i don't and i'm like okay that's fine yeah i'll fix it and just throw it out there for other for everybody else which yeah. i'm not saying it's it doesn't help me it does help me but i, I need think, more sometimes i think the best thing that like it's like, you know, like you know obviously like the 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 views and the likes like they're they're helpful i think the, the most helpful thing would be uh spreading the work you know like if you know, a retweet or a, a repost or uh, trying to get other people to see the work who might be interested in you know like something i've that i need to do is drop off like physical copies of my books at local bookstores you know just to try to get more stuff out there get a, get a review or something like that you know <laughs> my, my chair is not exactly visible um yeah uh but you know obviously like trying to like make it as a writer's you know pie in the sky kind of thing <laughs> but uh yeah i don't know it's i'm pretty much i'm gonna keep doing it someday it, it might take off someday it might not uh but i mean i couldn't just not do it yeah I same it. i like yeah, yeah, i don't I could lose my I have lost money doing it technically I'll keep doing it yeah I haven't um yeah I, I because I was doing it even before I had my website so it wasn't like I was waiting until all of a sudden I created all this stuff for my website you know what I mean I went yeah. to school for it 
too. And I, that was way before I even knew I was going to create one. So thinking that I was going to have some big, you know, successful novel in the making, but I can't, I, it's crazy to think that um, how my personal downtime would be if I didn't have writing. I don't know what I would do. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, I don't actually spend that much time writing. Like if I spent, if I focus, like this is why I'm kind of excited for not being in school is if I have, if I had that much extra time to focus on writing, I think that I could accomplish quite a bit. Like I always thought that if I weren't in school, I could knock out at least two novels a year. And, but you know, obviously like, like it's hard. I, I won't, I won't be in a position to do that until I'm probably in my thirties which isn't that far away, but, <laughs> um, you know, until I get there, I'm just going to keep doing what I can do. And short stories has arguably been the best way to move forward with that. Cause I've still made some really good stories. I thought that I think, you know, I'm a little biased, but I, I've made some pretty good short stories without having to do much, you know, I, I, like I do some, usually a lot of the stories that I, the short stories are kind of like a product of, research that i'm doing that are it's unrelated to it you know like learning about dystopias in my dystopian class is pretty much made me want to write dystopias for quite some time because there's a lot of content in our current world that would make for great dystopian stories and so you know all that together it just you know it produces story ideas in my head damn near every day so i got a folder full of papers that just say you know it's got a, a story idea sometimes if I, if I have a, a title in mind i'll write that on there too you know like the, the patriot and the other you know that one was the whole point of the title is supposed to be it's supposed to show the separation between like a true patriot of of the you know great nation and then that other person you know this disconnected lesser person who has more degenerative personality traits or characteristics you know this as outcast, you know, to be looked down upon. That's the kind of the whole perspective of that title. It's supposed to say a lot. Uh, and that kind of harkens back to um, old colonial stuff that I've read about, about, uh, you know, civilized races and then the others, you know, there's the European settlers and then those other savages who are incapable of any sort of civilization and are barbaric and savage in every way. You know, it's kind of that same sort of dichotomy but in a different setting with different people and a little bit interconnected to modern day politics in which some politicians are trying to dehumanize entire groups of people and it makes for a really good short story that actually is kind of scary considering how true it could be or uh -huh. is and i guess my, my short story is a bit more dramatic but if you read it, it doesn't sound like anything that's too far-fetched for any particular politician in a particular party in the United States to suggest. So, yeah. If you like any of that stuff, you're going to love this dystopian novel when it comes out. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> there you go. That's, and I lean towards drowning people with <laughs> cement <laughs> I, I thought you were, I thought you were just going to say, I, I lean towards drowning and then just end it there. <laughs> Like that's, that's a jinkies. Uh, that's a big jinkies. Yeah. No, I think I need to. <laughs> we'll play cinder blocks. Yeah, uh, I need to. With my short stories, I think I need to revert back to the crime genre, and I, I think that might actually like get the wheels turning for my novel a little bit more. Yeah. Because I've been doing all these. I mean, that whole time series was just. You were drunk and sad. <laughs> yeah. And then this last one, it was the first person perspective, but from, I don't want to give it away yet because uh, I mean, people you know, might not have read it. It's already been dropped. It would have been yeah. dropped by the time this episode drops, airs, but you might not know it. You might not see it. So this is the first announcement that it will be here. Huh. So I want you to read it. No kidding. All right. Well, I was going to say something. 
He already did. I think he gave it away. No, People no, might have I was, to. I was going to say um, something about. Uh, I was going to suggest if I do your novel, I was going to suggest that you watch some like serial killer movies. You know. Yeah, I'm going to have to get back into Criminal Minds again. Criminal Minds, uh, Law and Order, probably get back into that. Uh, like you, like I mean, I don't know, it's just something that I would love to see, but. You should try to make this serial killer the most like likable person as possible. Like you should make the novel the people the person watching reading the novel like you should want them to be like, man, this is a nice guy. He wouldn't just, you know. Well, I kind of have that in the back of my head. Like he's a like in his little um, blip that I created almost two years ago now. Yeah. Um, Make him like a church member he, who does like, he, sir, uh, like, well, no, it's services. that's how it is. Is he's very likable. He wouldn't, they would never, you would never suspect, suspect, <clears throat> suspect, God, I can't talk today. You can expect somebody like him to do such a thing, but that's, but I hate the only, the only issue with that is, is that that's kind of a cliche too. Cause if you notice, if you watch crime episodes, like I can depict, one crime, criminal minds episode. This guy who was very likable in this develop community development was going and killing the wives around there, including his own. And you would never expect it until they figured it out. I can't remember his reasoning behind it because I hadn't watched it in a while. But you know, I, I guess like I, I don't like stereotypically evil bad guys you know that they're they're only evil for the sake of being evil i i, I think it's even if i don't I, I hesitate to say it's cliche to say that there should be some kind of logical reasoning behind what they do i mean I th- okay i guess if you're a serial killer maybe you don't have logical their, reasoning but in their head it's logical like th- if you yeah. read the prologue read the prologue it said specifically says like he's ridding the evil of the world and that's why god created murder is for people like him to rid the evil of the world and yeah. get back to what. So he's going to be like a hyper religious kind of person then? No, I, no. I think that was just, it was just a quick mention. I don't even know if I actually put God. I think that's, it could have been just. Uh, Satan? You no, know, you know, it could have just been uh, caught through context clues that he was just. That's what he thought, or it just said something like it was. It's not going to be hyper religious. You could have him be there like are a, a lot of a those pagan too. worshiper. He's like trying to please some weird pagan god from the old countries, you know, and it requires sacrifices. No, this guy, he's killing these people because it reminds him of somebody. Uh, that is also that is also written in the prologue. Which doesn't sound like you have written or you have read my prologue. <laughs> I have. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I, I forget a lot of stuff. Uh, man. So, no, I'm just kidding. I can't even remember kidding. half of what I write. Yeah. But, but I think I need to start. Well, well, like I said, I've been trying to read more. Some days it works. Other days it just doesn't work. Because I'm like, like, I know I know if I start reading, I'm going to fall asleep in like five minutes. So it's like, there's no point. Because I'm gonna have to reread those five pages anyway. Fair enough. But, yeah, probably leaning towards TV and movies would probably help. Or yeah. LA Noir if I ever want to turn on my Xbox again. Yeah, I, I think I, don't know, I was I always think stories where you can if you can kind of relate to the bad guy or if you can sympathize with the bad guy, it makes the story more compelling. Like I just keep thinking back to Breaking Bad, which. It Never is seen. kind of old. Well, yeah, it's really good. I mean, they take this like really dorky, kind hearted chemistry teacher and turn him into a meth making <laughs> drug emperor who, you know, gets family and friends killed and he's psychotic. You know, like he goes, it's, it is such a character arc. That I have never seen before, nor have I seen it really. There's there's something else that I've seen uh, that I think kind of has been able to create that kind of arc, but it's very rare that you see a character arc done that well. And because at the end of the, the series, the main character 
is a evil bastard, but you're sympathizing with him. You're still upset when he's like, you know, when you think he's going to, oh man, he's going to go down. He's going to die. And you're starting to feel like worried for him, even though this guy is a meth dealer who literally is like, well, he's way now more you know meth how, dealer. You know, he's just this crazy psycho. But. Well, now you know how I felt at the end of the, uh, the mob documentary on uh, Netflix bugging the mob after they all got arrested and one one of the mob bosses got whacked. I was like, this sucks. I don't like this. I've been kind of rooting for you the whole time. Well, it's similar, but I, I feel like the average non-Italian person <laughs> isn't going to have similar uh, predispositions for the mafia. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, that's fair. Man. <laughs> This is the death of organized crime. This is awful. <laughs> Who's going to extort those mom and pop shops at the corners? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, who's going to run our just, um, garbage management. systems now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, God. But it's, it's a difficult task to, to build that sort of... No. Um, that takes a lot of a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of not a lot of distractions. So you got to be honed in, know what you're doing. I mean, that, that show went for five seasons. It was quite a, quite a story. But I don't know. I know this dystopia work, I'm, I, this dystopia novel I'm working on isn't very character heavy as of yet. I'm, I'm still not really sure exactly what it'll be like, but <coughs> I'm leaning towards making the world be the main character. If that makes any sense. But um, th- no, it reminds me of that uh, that webinar I watched with the two authors that the Tampa Bay Times put on, and uh, one of the authors I can't remember which one said that they don't use sometimes they don't use characters; they use like houses or the town to really kind of like dr- drive the story forward, and the characters are kind of the the protagonists or the sorry the characters are just secondary; they're just kind of there to. Yeah, story forward. That'd be interesting too. Yeah, because like a view of a house, or something. Oh, I just gotta see it like hurt. that. I just had, I just had an, no, I just had an idea for a short story. Talking house. Just pop, what? Is it a talking house? It might be a talking house. <laughs> like in, like in, uh, Family Guy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh huh. Um. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. with my novel idea like what i really want to show is how the world changes and it's hard to do that with one single character unless they're superman or uh a traveling diplomat i guess so like I've, the idea is to i don't know i still don't know exactly how i'm going to do it it's but you know i want to be able to show the americas europe asia all the changes happening that are climate-based but like there's also changing world order in like ongoing as well so like i kind of i don't know i'm I'm afraid of going too big with this so i kind of i gotta restructure but yeah not a lot to say on it for now Uh, well that's that keeps everybody who's listening in like wait and wonder and anticipation of how good this is going to be when it comes out Oh, I didn't get to come out this year. I can tell you that much. Well, then you're uh, just going to have to suck it up and wait. At, at the earliest, I would say like maybe mid to late 2023. That would be my, my ETA on it. As I said, I want to finish uh, Fairly Human 3, the sequel to the book that is not in my camera view because I am utilizing a Earth-based background. Yeah, I'm assuming it's Earth. That could actually be a uh, there it is. A planet that is livable but not Earth. But yeah, the sequel to that one right there. You know, so yeah. Once I'm done with that, I'll jump into it for, for uh, full on production, whatever. But until that point, I like this background. I've always loved you're, space. But you're going to hang out in space until that yeah. point. Some people get high with marijuana. I get high by leaving Earth's atmosphere. 
Yep. yep. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> I'm going to make a sequel to that, which I want. Well, yeah, the book's gone. Um, sequel should be out. I think I probably said summer of this year. Uh, I'm going to develop it as much as I can. And then like the moment that school's over, I'm just going to like try to knock it all out in a month. So shooting for around 200 pages. Let's see if it happens. I am a little skeptical, but we'll make it happen. Then we'll edit it. Not once, not twice, maybe three times. And then hopefully, hopefully June, July, I can put it out. Probably July if I had to guess. So. And then, uh, then I have a year to try to do this dystopia novel before I go back to school. So, yeah, those those are good plans. I hopefully we'll have a novel in the next five years. That's all I got for you, people. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got for you. There's a there's a good quote by somebody that says, "Begin, the rest is easy." I mean, you know, it's. Is that not Gary Paulson? I don't believe so. No, he, he doesn't make said, many quotes anymore. Um, no, he, said, he said write, right? Huh? He just said you just got to write or something. Yeah, did maybe he did say. I, I honestly, I don't know. I, I, I have quotes in my head. I don't know who, who said them. I have a book of quotes. I was going to check that, but I guess I better just uh, go straight to the source, huh? Yeah. Right every day, every single day. No excuses, no exceptions. Okay, Keep your more. pen or your fingers on the keys moving. Don't worry about being good. Just get the words on paper. You can fix it later, but you can't improve what never made it to the page in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a little bit more aggressive than he than I attended, but that works. What? I didn't expect his quote to be that kind of aggressive. Oh. I yeah. don't think he said that in an elegant way. Doesn't sound like he could. I we can find that. Uh, I, I have this really awesome book of quotes that, uh, that you can't really see. Damn it. We might a little spaced out over here, you know? <laughs> uh, there uh, it there is. There we go. Back to my... So I got this fancy looking book, you know, which uh, it's actually... It's a Bordeaux journal. The journal cover reproduces a gold tooled and painted binding of the Breviarium Romanum or Roman Breviary, the daily prayers described, prescribed by the Catholic Church, published by Claude Piquet and Lyon in 1556. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bunch of useless information. I thought it was a neat book at the time. I didn't realize it had religious undertones, but you know. I got all these quotes in them. One of the quotes on here that I, I've always enjoyed is a quote from a character in Fallout New Vegas. And the guy says, too many people have opinions and things they know nothing about. And the more ignorant they are, the more opinions they have. So true. So true. Let's see if I can find that quote. By all means, if you have any uh, commentary in there. Didn't I? Didn't one of my? Uh, didn't a sentence for, or a quote from my prologue make it into that? Or did you just write it down on a piece of paper and then give it back to me and say it was good and then that was it? I have no idea what you're talking about. What, what quote was it? His day job was grave at best. That. Uh uh, what? What was those? What was those circumstances? Uh, what about that? You, quote? He, you read it. You read the prologue, and then gave me. <laughs> you handed it back. You gave it to me on a ripped piece of paper, and said, "I wrote this down because I liked it." And then I realized it was <laughs> kind of comical at the same time. Well, okay. So I found it to be quite comical and quite hilarious for a number of reasons. Many of which I don't know if you want me to even talk about. But, uh, yeah, that, that was why. That's okay. disappointing. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a good I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I, no, I got, I got it. No, I'm just kidding. Here's an interesting quote. 
from somebody named Norman Cousins. They say, death is not the greatest loss of life. The greatest loss of life is what dies inside us while we live. Okay, yeah, a lot of sad quotes in here. That's that, that one. Here's, here's uh, an interesting quote. We are a sad generation with happy pictures. So okay. Okay, I mean, before before you we end this little segment on Todd quotes, we might have to end it with a, a positive one. Oh, I'll have a positive one. But they're not my quotes. These are quotes from other people. Here's one from Barbara F. Walter. Eliminate the underlying conditions that make an extreme ideology expedient to embrace, and you eliminate the incentives elites and moderates have to back it. She wrote a bunch of stuff on civil wars. I actually have one of her books somewhere. She would have actually wrote a book about potential civil wars in America, or like not if there would be one, but if like like what kind of um, circumstances would need to exist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. She studied civil wars for decades, and I learned about her in my conflict in the world class that I took like two years ago. That's what happened. You have any quotes that you like? Um. Not from, I have a couple movie quotes, but uh, uh, they're not, one is not appropriate for, I mean, it's really, it's PG appropriate. It, it's kind of more inspirational for other things. Uh, well, here's a, a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. You know who that okay. is? I he know who that is. Gatsby, I think. He did. Yeah. So he said, writers aren't people exactly, or if they're, any good there are a whole lot of people trying so hard to be one person i feel like you're going through a, you know what this reminds me i was a senior high school yearbook and you just go through the senior quotes and all these these people yeah. picking out inspirational ones to try to you know and then you get the couple people who just have whatever and then there's one that you have one or two that just have no no comment or no quote <laughs> I mean, yeah, who are you? Uh, here's, a, here's another one. I don't know who whose quote this is. The initials are just A-Y, but they say, we are writers. We don't cry. We bleed on paper. That's good. You know how, because you know, the idea being... No, I, yeah, no, yeah, I got yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. I don't, have, I, can't, I don't have the one quote that I was looking for. I can't even remember what the original quote I was looking for was. But yeah, on that note... Oh my Time God. to end these shenanigans. <laughs> well, people, hope you have enjoyed the show. We are. I think we didn't even the Weather Channel. We we didn't even mention that it's daylight. This is the first time in two weeks that we have yet to do. We haven't done it after dark, and those shenanigans episodes were much worse. Yeah, after dark. So I'm sure our listeners are fascinated by this news. <laughs> Uh, they couldn't figure it out yeah. from the daylight. Yeah. Or if they're even still watching. In which case, you really are the MVP. Um, yeah, so um, hopefully you enjoyed watching and or listening. I mean, if you're on Spotify and you're hearing this episode, you are the first person to listen on Spotify in quite some time. Long time. So, That's not one of us. Yeah, I mean, I'd never listen to this crap. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and spread this content all over the world. Show it to your family. Send it to your friends. Even that uncle you don't talk to because they have really questionable political positions. Just send it to everyone. All right? We're desperate. Anyways, thank you. Have a great day.